it may not be too much of a compliment to say that Oppenheimer is the most ambitious film by director Christopher Nolan, telling the story of the atomic bomb father, one of the most curious and controversial characters in human history. The film Oppenheimer takes the audience through a series of different times to discover not only the process of creating the bomb, but also the path that led Oppenheimer to this mission and its consequences. To best describe Oppenheimer's complex and controversial character, as well as the many twists and turns of the film, director Christopher Nolan had to mention quite a lot of details and concepts that may cause many viewers to be puzzled. So to help you rewatch the film in a more complete way, and from there, maybe increase your appreciation for this film, today, Film Theory will explain seven details that we think are difficult to understand, but are very important to Oppenheimer. And be aware that this video will contain a lot of spoilers. All fans of director Christopher Nolan know that he is very passionate about mixing the timelines of the film for storytelling purposes. We have seen Nolan do that in Memento, The Prestige, or Dunkirk, and Oppenheimer is also told in a non-plural order. Oppenheimer has two timelines mixed together. The first timeline started in 1926 and took place entirely in colorful scenes. It tells the story of the life of Jay, Robert Oppenheimer, from when he was still a student to the end of the construction of the atomic bomb. Meanwhile, the second timeline, with black and white scenes, mainly revolved around the 1959 U.S. Congress of Louis Charles. The fact that these two timelines are told in two completely opposite colors is not a coincidence, but the choice of director Nolan. Colorful scenes give the audience the subjective perspective of Oppenheimer. Therefore, we can see even the scenes that originate from his imagination. The purpose of these segments is to focus on the side of Nolan, of Oppenheimer's mind. Meanwhile, the black and white fragments bring a more objective perspective of Oppenheimer's story from an observer and an outside predictor, Louis Strauss. Another notable detail is the name of these two time streams. The colored time stream is often called fission, while fusion is called black and white time stream. In my opinion, this detail can be understood in two ways. Fission is the process of an atom splitting into smaller atoms, while fusion is the process of atoms merging together to form a new atom. In terms of storytelling, Oppenheimer's fission time stream is when events begin to split and unfold, and then they are put together in the fusion time stream to reach a conclusion. We can also understand this detail in a more obscure way. Molecular reaction is the basis of the atomic bomb, and therefore the atom is nicknamed for the time period described by Oppenheimer's perspective. The atomic bomb is a terrifying weapon, but it still cannot be compared to the destructive power of the thermonuclear bomb a weapon created on the basis of the principle of nuclear reaction. Therefore, this may be how director Christopher Nolan conveyed the message that although Oppenheimer's atomic bomb is a terrifying invention that brought humanity to the atomic realm, but the creation of the atomic bomb, along with the greed and selfishness of humans seen in the nuclear reaction, is more dangerous, pushing the world into an arms race and bringing humanity to the brink of extinction. In the entire process of when Oppenheimer directed the project to create the atom bomb, the characters often referred to a concept called compartmentalization. Compartmentalization is a secret strategy that Captain Leslie Groves wants to implement for the entire Manhattan Project. Accordingly, each part of the project, such as the physics, chemistry, engineering, or logistics, will not be communicated and communicated with each other. The basis of the secret strategy is when fewer people know all the information about the task in progress, the possibility of all the important information being leaked out and falling into the hands of the opponent is less. However, as the conversation between Oppenheimer and Leslie Groves in the film pointed out, the topic of the atom bomb has seen that this secret strategy will cause more difficulties than benefits. The only way for the US to race against Germany in the process of creating the atom bomb is if all the best scientists in this country work together. That's what Oppenheimer built in Los Alamos. Towards the end of the film, we are revealed that Louis Strauss was the one who arranged all the investigations and procedures of Oppenheimer in order to disrupt the career of the former project director of Manhattan. So why is Strauss so hostile to Oppenheimer? Everything that Robert Downey Jr. did was a bite-to-bite -bite move to take back a few points of view on Oppenheimer. One of those disagreements is Strauss's and Oppenheimer's opposition to the need for a nuclear bomb. In the first phase of the Manhattan Project, 
we see Oppenheimer and scientists discussing the best way to create a nuclear bomb. Most of the proposals are related to the use of uranium or plutonium to separate the nucleus, thus creating a nuclear reaction. But among those scientists, a physicist named Edward Teller again proposed the use of hydrocarbons to create a nuclear reaction. This reaction will create a weapon later called a bombhead, with a destructive power estimated to be as powerful as 1,000 times that of a nuclear bomb. The first atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. However, Oppenheimer, perhaps because he saw the terrifying power of the bomb, turned Chawler's proposal aside to focus on the nuclear bomb project. After the end of the war, President Harry Truman established the Nuclear Energy Commission with the task of taking over the U.S. nuclear program after the Manhattan Project. These are the people we see gathered around the round table in the film, including Louis Strauss and Oppenheimer. This scene took place in 1949 when the U.S. military discovered a radiation signal from the first atomic bomb. The U.S. is no longer the only nuclear powerhouse. Strauss wants to mobilize the U.S. government to focus on studying nuclear bombs, but he is met with opposition from Oppenheimer, who is now holding the position of chairman of the advisory board of the Department of Nuclear Energy. Oppenheimer is concerned that the creation of bomb heads will only speed up the arms race, and thinks that the only deterrence measure that the U.S. AMR should use is to clarify the nuclear arsenal of this country. This is one of the first disagreements between Oppenheimer and Louis Strauss. Another disagreement between the two main characters of the film Oppenheimer is the opposing views on the issue of the export of nuclear weapons. I like a little bit the nuclear weapon is a kind of weapon of any chemical element that the atomic nucleus of the element in an unstable state from which it emits an ion. In fact, understanding the concept of the nuclear weapon is not too important to understand the story of the film. Just understand that this is a very important thing to create a nuclear reaction. After World War II, the nuclear weapon became the subject of a political debate in the U.S. Louis Strauss, in the position of the U.S. Atomic Energy Committee, said that the U.S. should have the exclusive right to nuclear weapons and should not export them, because it will accelerate the nuclear program of other countries. However, Oppenheimer and many scientists are against this. They know that in addition to creating atomic bombs, nuclear weapons have many other useful applications, such as medical. The film showed that Oppenheimer was not the inventor of the quantum reactor. This is a German-based team of scientists. This detail is one of the solid proofs for the argument that Oppenheimer was only the first person, not the only person, capable of creating the atomic bomb. This can also be applied to the issue of nuclear fuel export. Perhaps Oppenheimer realized that if the U.S. did not export nuclear fuel, no other country would be able to produce it. Therefore, he publicly defended Strauss's claims right before the U.S. Congress, thereby intensifying the relationship between the two characters. At the end of the film, the audience is revealed that all of Oppenheimer's plot, which we follow from the beginning of the film, is a result of a well-planned plan set up by Louis Strauss to destroy Oppenheimer's reputation. Immediately after being sworn in as chairman of the Nuclear Energy Committee, Strauss submitted a confidential document about Oppenheimer to a lawyer named William Borton, who had previously met Oppenheimer to express his consent for the plan to upgrade the U.S. nuclear arsenal a point of view that, as we know, the father of the atomic bomb completely opposes. This is partly why Borden quickly accepted Strauss's request to investigate Oppenheimer. Wanting to pay for the injustice, Strauss wants to condemn Oppenheimer as a threat to the country. This event took place right in the period of American history, now known as the Red Terror, when many characters were affected both in politics and in the entertainment industry, becoming victims of McCarthyism and condemning communism. Many parts of the story in the film show that Oppenheimer, although he was never a member of the American Communist Party, had a lot of friends and family. In addition, he has often expressed his views and, and actions, such as supporting the national defense in the Spanish Civil War. For these reasons, Strauss suspected that Oppenheimer could be a spy for Lenin, as the criminal had leaked classified information about the Manhattan Project to Lenin to successfully create the atomic bomb, and then again against the plan to develop the atomic bomb. The first scene of the film took place in 1953 when Oppenheimer lost his immunity and had to stand trial for a month in a closed court. As we have seen in the film, from the beginning, this was not a fair battle for Oppenheimer because in that court, there was even a lawyer who was fired by Strauss and the defense side for him did not get access to a lot of important evidence. The result was that even though Oppenheimer was no longer suspected of being a spy, he still did not regain his immunity. But many people may wonder why Oppenheimer cared so much about his security immunity. 
Wasn't it then that he had too many disagreements with the U.S. government on nuclear policies? The reason is that at that time, Oppenheimer was still in the advisory board of the Atomic Energy Committee, which meant that he could attend meetings with the most important scientists and legislators in the United States on the atomic issue. Oppenheimer disagreed with many of the policies proposed, so he had to attend these meetings to advise, influence, and propose new policies to manage weapons. And because these are very important and secret meetings, the only way to participate is to have the right to guarantee security. Therefore, the abolishment of Oppenheimer's right to guarantee security does not only mean the abolition of all the achievements he has built, but also the abolition of his voice on issues related to the atomic program in the future. The rest of the dialogue was reenacted in the film by Louis Strauss, which was five years later when Strauss was asked by the U.S. Congress to run for the position of Secretary of Commerce and Cabinet Member for President Dwight Eisenhower. From the beginning, we have seen Strauss quite reluctant that the Congress would question his involvement in the Oppenheimer case five years ago. But later, the audience was revealed that Strauss was actually a powerful figure in politics and the media, and he had secretly used a relationship to direct public opinion on his side. It seemed like a relief, but in the end, Strauss's ambitious plan was rejected after a witness revealed how Strauss had treated Oppenheimer. This is the character of Rami Malek, a physicist named David Hill. Before that, this character appeared twice in the film, with another author persuading Oppenheimer to sign a petition calling for President Truman not to drop atomic bombs into Japan. However, as we have seen, both times Oppenheimer often refused the persuasion of these two people. So the appearance of Hill in front of the Congress and protecting Oppenheimer is a twist of the film. The reason for this action is not clearly stated by director Christopher, but in real life, there are two reasons for Hill's criticism of Strauss and his protection of Oppenheimer. First, because the father of atomic bombs had previously changed his view of the necessity of bombing Japan. In addition, Hill also respected Oppenheimer's view of opposing the development of atomic bombs. Another reason for Strauss's dislike of Oppenheimer is the famous scientist Albert Einstein. Nolan's film has been repeated twice for the audience of the encounter between these three characters. First, in Strauss's perspective, we see Oppenheimer talking about Einstein. We don't know what they're talking about. All we know is that when Einstein comes to Strauss, he doesn't answer his reply, but just walks on. This made Strauss think that Oppenheimer was bad-mouthing him about Einstein. But the truth about how it was revealed is not like that. To understand the conversation between these two scientists, we need to go back to the time when Oppenheimer and the scientists were studying how to make the atomic bomb. At that time, Edward Teller scared people because he discovered that the detonation of the atomic bomb could cause a chain reaction, burn all the gas, and destroy the Earth. Oppenheimer then went to meet Einstein to ask him to review Teller's calculations. But the German physicist refused and said that he also hated mathematics as much as Oppenheimer. Then Oppenheimer was told by another scientist in the Manhattan Project that the other possibility was true, but the probability was nearly zero. And as we have seen, the Trinity experiment did not cause any chain reaction. But Oppenheimer knew that it was not that simple. He knew that his invention had destroyed the world. The atomic bomb was a Pandora box that Oppenheimer had opened, and now, no matter how hard he tried, he could not close it. So after watching the conversation about Einstein from Oppenheimer's point of view, we understand what they said. Oppenheimer asked Einstein if he remembered the day he met to talk about the possibility that the atomic bomb would destroy the world. Einstein replied, yes, of course, because who can forget such a terrible piece of information? Oppenheimer, in the final dialogue of the film, said that he thought he had done it, because now, with the existence of the atomic bomb, the world has changed forever, and humanity will always have to face the danger of death from the nuclear war. That dark scene was the thing that made Einstein lose his mind and not greet Strauss. Einstein and Oppenheimer are two great minds afraid of something bigger than them, bigger than anyone in our number. But Strauss, to me, so close to me, thought that conversation was about him. I hope this video has answered some of your questions about the Oppenheimer movie. After watching our video, go watch the movie again. You will like the movie even more. If we missed any details, please comment below. Maybe those questions will be answered in the next video about our Oppenheimer, or maybe it's because of someone else's hidden goodwill in the comments. And now, goodbye, and see you in the next videos. May the force be with you. I'm gonna make him an offer again. Play as time goes by. Hasta la vista, baby.